Civic responsibility is a feeling of duty towards your community. So for example, a person who donates to the local food bank or helps with the community cleanup is demonstrating civic responsibility. But should we require everyone to demonstrate a global civic responsibility? The reality is that most of what we do does have a global impact. By having recycling and compact composting programs in schools, we're reducing the amount of pollution in the environment. Or when we choose to protest against an injustice in another part of the world, it not only encourages the government to take more action, but brings more awareness to people in your own community about a global issue. The focus of this unit is whether we do have a global civic responsibility, and if so, what actions can be taken to help make the world a better place. The first thing to look at is quality of life. We've already discussed this term, which looks at how happy you are versus your standard of living, which looks at your material well-being. Quality of life looks at your access to education and health care, the health of your environment, whether you have a stable political system, and even entertainment. Quality of life and standard of living are somewhat intertwined because studies have found that having a low standard of living can cause stress, which then reduces your quality of life. But having a high standard of living can also cause stress. Often when we're looking at a country, we often first look at the GDP or gross domestic product. This is the country's standard of living. And we have to be sure to look at the GDP per capita because that looks at the money divided by the number of people. China is a good example of this. Find out China's overall GDP compared to Canada and look at their GDP per capita compared to Canada and notice the big difference. In recent times, there's been a greater focus on measuring the quality of life in a region. The Genuine Progress Indicator looks at sustainable development and also considers the balance of the pros and cons to economic development, including environmental and social impacts. In Bhutan, the government has adopted a gross national happiness policy that looks at many of these indicators. For example, they've chosen to not allow major corporations to come in and harvest trees on a large scale, even though that would significantly increase the GDP of the country, because they're concerned about the environmental damage and the social impact of increased disparity and materialism. The United Nations also reports on the Human Development Index each year, which looks at the GDP per capita, or standard of living, and life expectancy and access to education, quality of life. At the turn of this century, the United Nations established the Millennium Development Goals, which encouraged governments to take action to eradicate hunger and poverty, provide universal primary education, promote gender equality, ensure environmental sustainability, and deal with several specific health issues. Do some research to find out what actions have been taken and what's the progress on achieving those goals. Other international organizations like the G7 and the EU or European Union are taking action in these areas by signing international agreements. For example, the elimination of landmines in war-torn areas to make them safer. But powerful organizations like the WTO didn't really care about global civic responsibility until individuals began to protest, really starting with the 1999 protests in Seattle, Washington against globalization, specifically the mistreatment of coffee growers by major corporations like Starbucks. As a part of the responses to these protests, there's been increased support for the idea of fair trade, where the workers in the environment are treated fairly, versus free trade, which is trade with less barriers like tariffs. You can now improve the quality of life in, of individuals around the world through fair trade products, also known as consumer activism. I love the store 10,000 Villages. Do you have one near you? Buying items in stores like these, you know that what you've purchased has been created in a fair and sustainable manner. Many companies are now putting the fair trade label on their products, like coffee and chocolate, so that we can know the standard of living and quality of life of those producing these products is, well, fair. Companies are also adopting civic responsibility departments. For example, the company IKEA states they want low prices, but not at any price. In other words, not at the expense of quality of life for anyone making their products. When you take action to purchase products that demonstrate a global consciousness, you are advocating for people around the world. This is known as dollar voting, and it can be quite powerful. Corporations want to make money, and they do this by creating products that are in demand. Your demand will tell them what products they should make. Technology has also allowed us to improve the quality of life for people in remote areas. The transportation of vaccines for things like malaria have been made much more efficient using equipment like drones in programs that can be financed by developed nations, allowing for more people to be protected from diseases like malaria. Sharing information globally has also helped to stop or slow down the spread of diseases. The term pandemic is used when it spreads around the world. 
In the early 20th century, what we call the Spanish flu killed 2.5% of the world's population. Today, that would be close to 200 million people. From 2002 to 2004, there was a SARS outbreak, and the spread of that disease was limited through global cooperation. Then in 2014, an Ebola pandemic killed approximately 12,000 people, but it could have been even more serious, except that international agencies like the World Health Organization and NGOs like Doctors Without Borders worked to prevent the disease from spreading. The spread of the coronavirus, COVID-19, made us question the ability for international organizations to truly work together to prevent pandemics from spreading. In addition to sharing information about infectious diseases, developed nations have the funds to research and develop important drugs that can prevent disease and share that information with the less developed nations. Of course, the issue is that many of those medical breakthroughs come because of the motive for profit, which means doctors and scientists end up focusing on the drugs desired in developed world, where people can pay large sums for their drugs. At the turn of the century, many computer companies were looking at ways to provide access to technology in schools, but laying landlines for the internet access was difficult. Now, through satellite and smartphone technology, it's so much easier to give students in remote areas of, say, Central Africa or South America the same access to information that you have. Technology even makes it easier for families to migrate to other areas of the world because they know they can keep in touch with their family members who stay at home. And those NGOs are able to better fundraise and organize themselves because of modern technology. Organizations like the Red Cross are very important because they're seen as being neutral. They aren't controlled by any Western governments. Remember in the previous unit we talked about how developing nations may be suspicious of any foreign aid because it may be seen as a Trojan horse for colonization? NGOs don't want the government control. They just want to provide humanitarian aid to people. Do some research on various NGOs and find out which ones are the most effective in your mind.